if you don't know these two people, they've been working with us for a long time, and they have uh, intimate knowledge of our economy and the region's economy. They are co-directors of the Center for Economic and Business Research at Western Washington University. They are the good boys of economic development and economics. They're the good boys. Please put your hands together for James McCafferty and Hart Hodges. It's going to take a second. Hart, I'm a little concerned. I heard a lot of people very interested in economic forecasts today. I, I was hoping we'd learn stuff today. I'm all ears. Uh, me too. Anyone know? No? Okay. I'm also really concerned. None of these people have boxes around them. Have you noticed that? All right. Well, we'll, we'll get there. All right. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to jump in. We have, we're going to be uh, very tightly constrained in terms of time. Um, Teresa already has the slides, so they'll be available to anybody who wants them. We're going to start with a national outlook uh, and explain some of the tensions uh, that you can expect. Uh, and then we'll, we'll dig down into to more local. If we run out of time, uh, especially on some of the data slides we have at the end for Kitsap County, uh, they'll be available. So um, should we just jump right in? Get ready to rumble. No, okay, no. let's do it. No. Uh, so the, the title was Yogi Was Right. So I've got the, the quote from, from Yogi Berra. Uh, and I think it's particularly appropriate for everything going on today. Uh, bear with us. You're going to get a lot of arguments, and I, and I don't mean this type of argument where there's always disagreements about what sort of policy response uh, might be appropriate for a, for a given issue, right? So uh, you've got one group that's saying the Federal Reserve is still going to be raising rates uh, at least one more time uh, and holding rates steady uh, through 2023 uh, and into 2024. No, big rate cuts later this year. That's right. Oh, wow. That's the debate, right? And some people say we're already, already late on that. You're, you're always going to get those sorts of debates. We're going to talk about arguments about the data uh, and, and some of the problems uh, that are emerging. This looks solid. All right. So blue chip consensus forecast, that's our starting point. Uh, we also have the National Association of uh, Business Economists uh, forecast as well. Uh, are you saying these numbers aren't right? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. What's wrong with them? I am. So the top line, uh, one of the measures of inflation, consumer price index. Uh, blue chip consensus is that it falls to 3.6 this year and then down to 2.4 next year. We're going to tell you why uh, we might get there. My, those numbers might emerge this year, but we're not going to get down into 2.4 next year. Uh, unemployment. I have to revisit all the unemployment numbers, how they're calculated, what it means, lot of, lots of data there. And James, uh, it, the GDP forecast is for growth this year. Does that mean no recession? Well, isn't that how we define a recession? We'll have a quiz for you in just a second. All right, good, good, so good, good. Backing up the same forecast, but on a quarterly basis, uh, the GDP uh, numbers are expected to go down this quarter relative to last wait, quarter. Wait, you said GDP was going to go, wait, I'm, I'm, these are negative numbers. Huh. So quarter to quarter, there is uh, some expected contraction, but for the year, uh, some growth. You know, Howard, I, I struggle with these numbers. You should. I, I struggle with them because I see words like average, median. I see um, year over year, quarter over quarter, annualized. How's a guy supposed to know what he's looking at? Be careful, right? Some of the numbers that you're going to be getting are the change from one quarter to the next, like from fourth quarter of 2022 to the first quarter of 2023. Other numbers are going to be year over year. So first quarter of 2023 compared to first quarter of 2022. And it matters a lot, especially if you're thinking about inflation today. Uh, so when I look at GDP here at negative 0.1 for Q1, that assumes GDP activity for 12 months divided by whatever to get me the so quarter? It's an annualized, a lot of the numbers are annualized to make them consistent but they're not consistent in terms of quarter to quarter, year over year, and so on. Uh, so the first quiz, right, if this, if, if you remember from high school. High school, this is fifth grade. All right, so high school economics class, a uh, recession is, somebody probably told you, two consecutive quarters of decline in GDP. Looks like we have it. Yeah, that's that three even, maybe, extra. Maybe, maybe not. But oh. first, is that the right definition of a recession? Anyone? Anyone want to go on this bet? So you got to no. pick A or B. How many people want to go with A? James, I'm going to ask you. Oh, dang it. I was going to phone a friend. Well, 
I'm gonna, you know, the easy answer would be to A, but I think you've teased enough here. It's gotta be I, B. So it is B. The National Bureau of Economic Research looks at about six or seven major statistics, not just GDP. They look at employment, they look at productivity, they look at uh, sales, retail activity, and so on, to determine whether or not we're in a recession. And uh, the Bureau is the group that dates recessions. It said it started here, it ended here, and so on. Uh, they do that later, right? Like it takes a while? Often after the fact. Okay. But a lot of problems right now. The data are being revised. We were talking all the way down, James, survey responses. So uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, other groups get data by surveying businesses and whether it's on job turnovers, whether it's on how many people are working, et cetera. There's survey. The survey responses are historically low. As in pre-pandemic, 70 80%, now 30%. That would be your job labor turnover survey, JOLTS, if you're kind of nerdy. 30% um, response rate on JOLTS from employers, which means we're a little suspect of the data so that a, you're a seeing of, in headlines. A lot of the data has a, a bigger band of uncertainty around it, if you will, which results in revisions. So when we're working on a forecast for Puget Sound now, and we have some data from February, the data actually are for, say, September. A month or two from now, they're going to come back and say, oh, We've had new information. We're going to revise the numbers from September. So lots of revisions. That's one source of, of argument, if you will, in addition to the quarter over quarter and that sort of thing. The other thing that's going to be tough to call a recession is can we really have a recession if unemployment is below 5%? Wait, isn't 5% unemployment normal? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Isn't that Econ 101? No, right. So we're supposed to have a, there's always a natural rate of unemployment in terms of people in between jobs, people taking a break. There's always a little bit of structural unemployment. And the natural rate changes over time. So some people might say 4%. Some people might say closer to 5 But 4 or 5% unemployment is rather low, right? Well, on this roller coaster, it looks pretty low. All right. So a couple of people have said, including Janet Yellen, that you're, you can't have a recession with unemployment like we, like we have it. So there's that sort of tension as well in terms of can we be in a recession? So let's dig into, Jay, you were asking about where are all the workers. So let's dig into that a little bit. The, uh, this graph shows the activity rate, which is really employment as a ratio of just population. How many how many people live in a community, how many people are working in that community. We also have the labor force participation rate, which is a little bit more nuanced. Uh, we've seen a drop in the number of people employed for the given population. And if we dig into that a little bit more, uh, these are some long-term trends in terms of the labor force participation rate. The top graphic, you don't, is, uh, these go from about 19. Uh, now, Hart, you gotta, yeah, I, gotta, I gotta call out your scales here. Um, the, the women are not, the, at, optically here, it looks like the women are really going to work here and the men are staying home. I don't know. But maybe, I, I, I had signed up, but the scales are different here, so be aware of that. All right, so what I'm trying to show is that in the, over the last uh, you know, 30 years, the labor force participation rate for men, the top gra graph, it's been going down. Slackers. Over time, that was offset by the increase in the labor force participation rate by women, but not over the last couple of decades. You know, what's weird about this is that in this part of the graph, post-pandemic, we've seen this big increase lately of women going back to work. And we've seen the headlines, women are going back to work. You know what's interesting? They're going back to work part-time. It's not the same FTE count. It's not the same, it's the same number of belly buttons. It's not the same amount of work effort. Uh, and so from a production standpoint and from a lifestyle pers perspective, we're seeing significant changes in American households in who's going to work and how they're working. That's also a problem in the data because some data is belly buttons and some is actual output. And you have to be really careful what you're looking at. So part of the reason we show these two graphs together is getting you to think about just the, the natural dynamics in the labor force. I also wanted to, want you to focus on the top one for a second. When you think about uh, the, the loss of, of workers in, in the pandemic, is it really that shocking? I mean, you can see the drop in men, in men working, 
Uh, and the labor force participation rate, by the way, is the, uh, the number of people that are in the labor force, and you have to be looking for work to be in the labor force. So if I'm just sitting on my couch playing Nintendo, I don't count? You don't count. Oh. So if, if employment security can't identify you, you haven't been looking for work, your unemployment benefits have run out, and so on and so forth, you're off on the sidelines. And, and you can see that what the pandemic did to that. So we had a lot of people just step out of the labor market. COVID, early retirement, what have you. That changes all of the measures of unemployment. So one of the reasons we have low unemployment is we don't have as many people even participating in the labor force. But I want you to notice in that top graph, we're still about on trend. So you're asking where are the workers, Jay, and they may not be coming back for a while, right? And this, we may not be in a very different place than we would have been without okay. a pandemic. So shrinking this in just the, the, the last several years, you can see that this, the, the solid orange line is what we would think about as the potential, what we expect uh, given demographic trends and some other things that have been happening, what we expect in terms of labor force participation. And then the squigglier line is the actual labor force participation rate, and you can see it dropping with the pandemic, and that, but only coming back potential. It's not bouncing back to where it was in 2000. So this is not a COVID problem that's gonna go away by 2024. You have fewer teenagers working, you have more people in their 50s and 60s retiring early, so you have a, a less participation of people that are uh, of working age, and this is going to continue for a decade or so. So unemployment measures in 2023, 2024 aren't really showing you the exact same thing that they did 10 years ago, and you have to think about that when you're looking at some of the data. You know, Hart... As I look at consumer data and consumer confidence and all those kinds of things, and it all goes back, and the charts look very similar to this one, where coming out of the 2008 Great Recession, the American consumer is concerned. And it shows up in the data today as confidence problems in the economy. I think we'll see more of it as we see other slides. But this just reminds me that you see the same drop here in labor force participation. People dropped out. And so I like to think of the human psychology side of economics, and I have to wonder what happened in that 2008 crash that shook people in a way that changed their behaviors in a long-term way. Well, I mean, you see that in a, coming out of a lot of recessions, but just magnified over the last, last two. I'm sure a pandemic didn't help. All right, so James, if I'm sitting there saying, calling a recession, it's gonna be very difficult with labor force participation as it is, unemployment the way it is. What else should we look at to try to say, yes, there's gonna be a recession, no, there's not in, 20, in this, this coming year? Well, I look at, again, I go back to consumer behaviors. I, I, I wonder about people's buying behaviors and, and how they're consuming and those consumption functions and how household, household incomes and budgets are gonna work. All right, so part of that, especially in the Puget Sound area, right, we had a lot of sales uh, pulled forward. People bought computers, people bought furniture, people bought stuff. The subsequent years are going to be slower. And you're saying on top of that, if, I, if I'm being told things are negative or if I'm worried about inflation, uh, that's going to come I might pull back even more. Right, so that, makes, that means recession more, more likely, even if it's a recession with a small r because no one's going to officially call it. I'm going to dig into what else to consider. I'm going to add inflation. Uh, obviously, the, the big worry of the day for the Federal Reserve. So three lines here. Um, the, the gray line that went straight up, uh, that was uh, the hunt for toilet paper. That was uh, the... Those were good times. <laughs> the, the, need for, the need for furniture for your new office and that sort of thing. It's come back down. Those were core, core goods, uh, the stuff that we were buying. The worry that the Fed has is the, the purple line. Services still going up. I priced a uh, working with a guy who owns a food truck yesterday, the other day. Why? I, oh, just for, mind, we're just mind. talking about prices of things. And you know, a basic dinner at his food truck is now over $20 per person. And I was just about fell out of my proverbial seat. $20 at a food truck? Wow. But yeah. Nice, nice truck. Yeah, I guess so. All right. So we think about where price is going to go from here. Uh, because we really need to be looking forward more rather than backwards. A lot of the data is, is uh, in, the, in the past. 
Uh, we know that some of, their, some of the pressures from supply chain, and you've been following uh, shipping costs. So buying stuff has gotten cheaper again. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like it, but it has. Right. But if China reopens, or as China reopens, new COVID policy, more demand for oil and sort of a, a, the, the global price pressures, uh, geopolitical unrest with U Ukraine at, at the top causing, causing problems for foodstuffs, especially cereals, energy, and so on. Um, and then uh, just money. We forget how much money. This is disposable income. These people uh, look loaded. <laughs> the amount of oh. money that was pushed into the economy in the various uh, stimulus packages, and you can see them, right, with, uh, right at the beginning of the, of the pandemic and then uh, the, a year later, that amount of money is still out there. Now, one thing to keep in mind is it is not evenly distributed. At the lower end of the income uh, spectrums, you're seeing people starting to tap uh, revolving credit. Uh, credit card debt is up. Uh, hey, got to be American, right? Yeah. Uh, so this graphic, we can go off on a lot of tangents about stock prices, home prices, and some other things. A lot of money pushed out there. It's still being spent. Right, so you've, you've got global pressures to keep inflation a little bit higher than, than we want. And we, we've still got to let this uh, beast run through the... And this begs the, the conversation of whose economy do you want to talk about, right? Do we want to talk about the average economy? Or do we want to talk about your economy? Or maybe it's your economy we should talk about, right? Because they can be very different, but yet it looks rosy so we, here. we play too much with, with aggregate statistics broad U.S. metrics or something like that. Uh, and, and we miss uh, differences by gender, differences by ethnic group. We miss especially differences by, by income group. Uh, this money is, is sitting with people that are rather wealthy at this point, and it, and it, does, it does matter. Um, inflation expectations matter. I love this chart. You're Part, a nerd. When I go out and ask people, what do you think what do you think's inflation going to do? Oh, I think it's going to go at least four or five percent still. Yeah, yeah. And then maybe in two or three years from now, it'll be like closer to two or three. Great. Okay. That's this chart. That's so what this is showing. Current, currently, if you ask enough people, the average is that they think inflation is going to be a little over four percent in a year. Remember, the blue chip consensus was it's going to drop below four this year. We'll see. Uh, if you ask people and they, they think inflation is still going to be close to three percent three years from now, if you're, go ahead. Here's my concern with this. <laughs> I'll pick on this table over here. You own a company and you know that she's expecting four or 5% inflation. What do you do with your prices? You take it to the bank, you get her four and 5% and you go home, right? And that's actually what we think is happening in the US economy. We think that businesses are seeing the same data going, sweet, we can raise our prices and people are expecting it. It's fine. But the Federal Reserve knows that. So the Federal Reserve has to keep pushing back to try to try to slow the economy down. Uh, this graphic, sorry about that, because the colors aren't aren't coming through really clearly. What's driving inflation? And in the the taller bars, uh, we had food. Uh, shelter has been a, a big big driver of the inflation metrics because there's uh, the the equivalent rent equivalent and all sorts of measures. Those will fade, right? Housing prices haven't been going up as much over the last six, 12 months. So it'll take another six months for that to ripple through and, and make it look like there's not much housing inflation. But the services is, again, uh, the bottom dark box in, in these, uh, these graphics. Um, and this is just the U.S. This looks very different for the EU, where well, energy I prices are a huge problem. What I want to say is notice that it doesn't get back down to the Fed's target until 2027. This is the Congressional Budget Office uh, expectation for inflation. Uh, we stole this from a talk from them yesterday, so it's f as fresh as you're going to get. Uh, but the, the Fed is, is thinking, oh, we can't, if our goal is 2%, it's still four years out, perhaps, or, or thereabouts. Speaking of the Fed, if they're worried about the uh, pace of inflation and the stickiness of inflation, you can ask 
how many more rate increases. Congressional Budget Office uh, and at least two of the Fed presidents are saying one more, rise, one more increase in federal funds rate. I thought we were going to have a 1% cut this year. That's, this bait that's, and switch? Stock, that's the stock market that's betting on that. Bait Finan and financial switch. markets are betting on, uh, if, if you look at what sort of uh, rate increases are, are sort of built into futures markets, uh, it's a rate cut. Is so a 2% rate even reasonable? There, there's a, Is that reasonable? 2% you know, getting back down to 2? Yeah. Not while inflation is over 3. Hmm. Interesting. Huh. Right. So. Again, expectation, possibly one more cut. Uh, and I will say no rate cut in 2023 without something really bad happening. So the, down at the bottom, it's, it's supposed to be talking about uh, we're, we're looking at a different regime. When you think about uh, what's happening with supply chains, what's happening with transitions in energy, what's happening with, and you can fill in the blanks or go on and on, things are going to be a little bit more expensive. So getting back down to 2%, getting back down to really cheap money the way we've enjoyed it for the last however many years is, is unlikely. Someone's putting the punch bowl away? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so the Fed is having to manage all at once inflation, trying to keep an eye on growth, and now they have to also uh, try to maintain financial stability. Is there something weird going on in the financial sector? Uh, some elementary mistakes, I would say. Uh, elementary. Yes. yes, thank you, my dear Watson. Uh, so, in some sense, what the Fed's doing and what banks are going to be doing on their own, because you think about Silicon Valley Bank or Signature Bank and others, uh, let's pull it back down, a nod to Kitsap Bank, but reg regional banks, most banks are going to have to be a little bit more cautious for a while. And regional banks are very important. Absolutely. They but, that, but that cautiousness means slower growth. Potentially fewer loans, a little more less, less a more conservative standpoint, so, perhaps. So, uh, and I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but just being, being mindful of, of the, the growth that was pulled forward into 2021, 2022, we just need a, 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 a bit of a pause or a reset. It, it feels like things are being slowed down. Well, the Fed's doing it on purpose. Huh. That's, right. how you're that's how you're going to control inflation. All right. All right. That's our national backdrop. And before we run out of time, let's try to dig into to something more. I'm more, watching Joe for the hook, so we're, we're okay so far. Uh, more, more local in, in terms of what's happening. And by the way, ask us questions. Easy you're allowed, questions. You're to really easy up. questions, though. Oh, you can answer the hard ones. Oh. All right. So if we come from National to, to Puget Sound, uh, this is the forecast that we prepare. We should do a shameless plug. We publish the Puget Sound Economic Forecaster, with, which is a subscription product. We'd be happy to sell you one. But we do a forecast for the region. It's the only regional forecast, and Kitsap County is one of the counties as part of the Puget Sound core area. So this is reflecting your community. Uh, we are actually worried about data revisions, which we mentioned earlier, employment security saying, wait, what you know the data uh, are a little bit different so we we are not calling for uh, a lot of job loss in the Puget Sound region I've heard a lot of layoffs uh, lots of layoffs but there's also some hiring so it's washing washing out at the moment uh, we could revise that uh, there's some noise from from employment security about some numbers that would make us lower our our forecast for 2023 in the first part of 2024 uh, the consumer price index measure that we show for the Puget Sound region is the Seattle CPI, uh, and it has been slowing faster than the, than the U.S. It also went up more early, right? So no, no shock there. Uh, jumping to uh, the Bremerton uh, Metropolitan Statistical Area. There was no spaghetti on the menu. Uh, there was. Bow tie pasta. Oh, okay. Um, this, the, the various lines, we just chose seven uh, sectors for... Uh, for the, this, is, this is job growth setting the value in the beginning of 2020, uh, so just before the pandemic really hit, at 100. So this is as just an index, or you can think about it as percent change. Uh, no real shocks uh, in terms of the blue line that dips down quickly, leisure and hospitality. Uh, one thing that stands out to, to us, uh, most of the sectors 
job growth is back to where it was. Not a lot of growth since the pandemic started. Uh, if you look at the, the greater Puget Sound area, there has been growth, especially in construction. Um, the, the professional business services is matched in the Seattle area by some of the IT type uh, information sector jobs. So no, uh, no alarm bells going off here. Um, we wanted to just throw out some other data that is available in case you say, wait a minute, that's kind of interesting. It gives me more insights into what's going on in, uh, in, the, in the Kitsap area. So this is uh, average earnings per job. The green line is Seattle. The orange line uh, is Washington State. And the blue line is, uh, is Kitsap County. Now, don't get too worked up that, oh my gosh, we're trailing Washington State. Uh, Kitsap actually is doing well here. We used to say that in the 39 counties in Washington, um, only two, even though Washington State is above the U.S., this is all relative to the U.S., so you can see uh, the 100% line down, down sort of low, uh, Washington State being above that. But of 39 counties in Washington, historically, only two have been above uh, the, the U.S., King and San Juan. Kitsap is bumping up against that, uh, trying to get up above the, the U.S. average, which is, a, which is a good thing. So there's been some nice growth uh, over the last... Um, 10 or so years, uh, doing well. And again, you, when you compare that against the 100, which is the U.S. average, that means you're moving against the U.S. It doesn't necessarily mean things are decreasing or declining in a way here. It just means that other places are catching up. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing either. Yeah. Um, maybe this is our depressing slide. Housing prices? Oh, well, uh, housing's super had, easy. Had to do, it, yes. how, 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 do you have no housing concerns, right? Huh, so, I, I detected the uh, small. The housing data is the most recent we could get, which is the, uh, the Q4 and some of the full year data uh, for uh, different counties in the state. The wage data is a, a quarter earlier, so take it with a grain of salt. It's not, not perfect because I'm getting data from different sources. Uh, and then the, the, the affordability index. Uh, we threw um, King and Whatcom on there just to, for, for some references. Housing affordability is a big issue. It's, a, it's an incredibly challenging issue uh, on, on a number of fronts. Uh, and Can you quickly explain the affordability index? What, what, do, what do I infer from that 67.7? The way that Washington State uh, Real Estate Center uh, calculates these is asking, can the person earning a median income pay the mortgage on the median house without being stressed on terms of uh, typically 30%, now that being stressed on the, in the housing burden of, the, of their income. Measures over 100 are affordable. So high, the higher the, the... Higher the number, the more affordable. The higher the number, the better. So in this case, Kitsap is the big, big winner here against <laughs> all the other people on this, on this list. <laughs> worst, but still below 100. The, so, worst dirt, the worst dirty shirt in the laundry? Right. Uh, the best dirty shirt. Oh, that's, that's, gonna, that's the, the... If there's a news reporter in here, there's your quote. Okay. All right, um, and, and then, a, then a reminder that there are a number of things happening. Everything we've talked about right now is, is just uh, the, the economy broadly defined, but it happens in context and it happens differently. You mentioned different people experience it differently. Different communities do as well. How are you dealing with homelessness or different measures or different indications of poverty? What about health care, delivery of health care? Challenges that people are paying attention to, energy, energy transitions. Uh, one of the things that, that, that might be uh, and really important going forward, as we think about hybrid work, remote work, three, three days in the office, whatever it might be, there's lower demand for office space. There's more people working in suburban areas. Well, some of the amenities that used to all be downtown now need to move out to suburban areas or buildings that are no longer fully occupied need to be converted. Groups like you making that happen and making your community appealing, attractive, and making it function uh, are, are hugely important. Uh, so it's not, not just what are the broad inflation numbers or so on. It, this stuff matters. Your job matters, Joe. <laughs> so, um, I'm looking at the clock, so I'm going to jump to our end. Um, check us out online and through your favorite device uh, or vice, whichever, however you say that. 
Um, also, if you'd like more information or have a question, reach out to us. We have an email. We're happy to talk to you. Um, and it's been a pleasure. So, any burning questions? All right, we're going to take no? the best question. Okay. No pressure. Who's brave enough to raise their hand? Come on, somebody do it. Somebody give me a hand, give me a hand. All right, you did it. Always in the front of the room. So, uh, you guys talked about part-time work and kind of how that affects the numbers. But is our area subject to more part-time work because we have so many people attached to the military and the shipyard? We're finding that. We're finding so many people don't want anything to do with full-time work anymore. Well, I could summarize that as U.S. standard answer now. No one's interested in full-time work, at least full-time in an office, right? I mean, um, it's, again, we have to think about different types of workers, right? There's, you're going to have different people. People that work at Target have a very different idea of work. Um, people are making lifestyle changes and really thinking about what that means in their household. Um, child care is a big piece of that. Uh, the, the cost of child care, um, there's an interesting op-ed piece today in uh, the Washington Post say, uh, saying that child care should be far more expensive in the United States. I, have you looked at... I, I haven't looked, but one thing is I would, I would say we should look at, say, Kitsap to Whatcom. Uh, Whatcom, I'm picking... Uh, because we have uh, a very large student population with most students working part-time. So we know, and we often compare Whatcom to, uh, or Bellingham will compare it to Burlington, Vermont, or Santa Cruz, California, or Flagstaff, where we know there are similar um, student loads because that influences retail sales. It influences uh, the, the employment data in a particular way. So it might be interesting to compare Kitsap to some of those counties and see how you compare to where you know part-time is, is significant. All right, uh, there's, a, there's an Eisenhower joke. Do you, you know the Eisenhower joke? Can you do the Eisenhower joke to sign off? You don't know, the, you know it, yeah? I think it's Eisenhower. Uh, why do you want a one-handed economist? That was, uh, oh, it's not Eisenhower, Say, go ahead, Hart. Oh, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna forget which one. On the one hand and on the other. Yeah, so if you, have a one -handed, if you have a one handed economist, he can't give you the other hand. By the way, give them a hand, right? Yeah, that was, that's a pretty good transition, I'll be honest. Thank you.